Hey, hey, what up, everybody? BQ here with the Impact Lounge, number one place to be for you, the Impact Wrestling fan. And it is your Impact Sacrifice review. I just wrapped up the show a few minutes ago. So most of you know I don't typically watch anything they do live, with the exception of the major pay-per-views. I'm sure the majority of you saw it live last night. And I must say, they are back. I felt that the last... The last few Impact Plus shows were not hitting the way that they had been. And usually these were really good quality shows. Uh, the last one, I don't even remember what it was. Maybe it was No Surrender. I, I don't remember offhand. Did not find it to be very good. And then I think the one before that was good. And then I think the one to end up the year in December, I don't remember particularly liking. So usually these are really, really solid. And one of my complaints recently with the television show was that what we see weekly on access tv is not a good representation of what these monthly shows are they're not a good representation of the pay-per-view you know the access tv show has a lot of a lot of comedy uh insert the word bad in front of that or not good however you want to say it there's a lot of that on the weekly show but you know but we watch these monthly specials, and it's great wrestling, great atmosphere, great look. You know, I still found it to be, I watch it on my big screen, still found it to look a little, little pixelated. The frame rate is very low, and you know it's a frame, a low frame rate when the wrestlers are running across the screen or they're doing moves and it looks blurry. So if you have not seen the main event Monday thing on YouTube, it is... Crystal clear, high definition. So I don't know if they're trying something different for that particular uh, match using a different camera. I don't really know. Um, I do have some experience in these areas, but not enough to like really speak on it. So I couldn't tell you if it's the same cameras um, and they're just exporting to an extremely low quality. Like I, I don't really know, but I know that this um, other than the frame rate still pretty bad. Um, still not really crystal clear, you know, definitely not HD, but other than that, no, no filters, no color correction. It wasn't dark. The lighting looked good. We can see the people, the camera was on the crowd. We could see people enjoying it, having fun, being engaged, being part of the show. The atmosphere was just tremendous. And if you're someone who's tuning into impact that doesn't watch a lot of impact and you see this. If you, you, the, the way that it looks, you're going to tune in again. But if you tune in like to this last episode where they're wrestling in the dark and there's 13 people on, on the screen and they got the piss yellow filter, then who's going to... I stole that from someone in the uh, Impact Lounge engagement group, piss yellow filter. I forgot who said it. I'll give you credit on the next show. Um, you're not going to... Who's going to tune in again to that? Because it looks like crap. And then you see this and it looks great. It looks... This competes again. It's not crystal clear, but it competes with what we see on TV. It competes with like if you've seen the Honor Club stuff, which still looks a lot better than this. But I'm just saying it competes with that. Even if you're watching AEW NXT, which clearly looks better, you can still compete with that with this product. And when I say compete, I don't mean you're going to have more viewers, but I mean. Those people, the people who watch those shows, you're giving them another option. Like they will tune into something that looks like this. So, um, right away, uh, it was off to a good start as opposed to last month's show was the entrance ramp and you know, all that. Uh, so anyway, um, as a reminder, the Patreon is brand new. It is free for the rest of the month. We've got like six days left in the month. Uh, this podcast that I'm recording right now will be on there ad free. Uh, so that's an option for you if you want to go to patreon.com backslash BQ speaks to check it out. But there will be a um, uh, podcast on there, um, uh, exclusive podcast. That's what I'm looking for. I was going to preview sacrifice on the Patreon because that, that's going to be Patreon exclusive every month. But with the Josh Alexander news yesterday, I had to use that block of time that I was going to preview the show and talk about Josh Alexander for the YouTube channel and all that. So um, let's talk sacrifice. Thanks for swinging by. If it's your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button. All right, 
so we start off with the countdown and it was a literal countdown the um if you've been to an impact show that's how they kick it off they're like you know whether it's borash or uh penzer you know we're, hey, we're gonna count down to 10 and then when 10 hits act like you're having all sorts of fun um <laughs> so we got that to kick off the show and I, I don't know if that was on purpose or or what it was um but we got that countdown and then we got the actual countdown the pre-show if you will to sacrifice so the first match being eddie edwards versus bupinder Gujar. um eddie looks ridiculous I, i've said this a few times i'm probably going to say it every time he wrestles he looks ridiculous he looks like someone that has never been a heel in their life, and they're trying to do what they think a heel should do, and how a heel should look. The only person who's ever pulled off that mohawk and got heat for it was Seamus. And that was very organic. The you look stupid. It was extremely organic. Uh, you know, we saw uh, Lesser Legend from Reno Scum use it when he came in, it, you know. That's his look. I'm not saying he used it on purpose to get heat, but you know, I, I don't think it was something that clicked with the audience as like, oh, he's 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 so edgy with his mohawk. And you know, it's the same thing with Eddie Edwards. Like he he looks ridiculous. The bright green looks ridiculous. Um, I was saying uh, on one of the the Patreon uploads because I, I do my week my weekly most impactful player. And I said it was Kenny King on the last episode because Kenny King is going, he's everything Eddie Edwards is not. And he's going to steer this ship in the right direction, just being associated with Eddie because he can talk. He looks good. Um, he has personality. He has charisma. He, he can get heat, you know, so Eddie's going to benefit from him quite a bit uh, with the two of them around each other. I didn't know this match was happening. I didn't know we were getting this. Um, I, maybe you guys knew. I don't. I, I've. <laughs> it's weird as a podcaster, but I've unfollowed a lot of their social media. You know, there's a couple I keep up with, but just I'm I'm so done with the old clips and all that shit. Um, it just wasn't beneficial to my social media experience. So I just you know unfollowed certain things. So I don't know um, if this match was announced prior. Don't have a a clue in hell. But it was a pretty decent match. Bupinder is is local to them. Um, he, he's a his local product there. So, uh, you know, he, he works as a baby face in this scenario. Is this a match that someone's going to tune in to for free on YouTube and be like, Oh, let me immediately go sign up for this thing. Probably not. Uh, but it was still a solid match. The problem is these, these matches are free on YouTube, but at one point, I mean, at, at any point, did Tom Hadfin get in there and say, Hey, this is, you know, you're watching us here for free on YouTube. If you want to see the sacrifice show, you can go to impact, you know, uh, download impact plus, or you can go to YouTube and, and, you know, where you're watching us right now and subscribe to the ultimate and nothing, nothing. So what is the point of doing the pre-show? If you're not, you know, hyping it up and giving people the opportunity to, to watch the rest of the show. Cause if, you know, some people might be tuning into the show and be like, I don't know how to fucking watch it. And there's not that much uh, data out there for, you know, not, not a lot of information for people to, to sign up, you know, like there was that initial press release. I talk about this all the time. And then after that, there's never been, Hey, this is what you got to do. And in this era, you have to hold people's hands. You have to like walk them through, through stuff like, Hey, it, you know, but whatever. Um, so yeah, the match was okay. Eddie wins with the Boston knee party. As simple as the Boston Knee Party is, I actually like it. Um, I, I like it because of the name. A finisher either needs to be good or has to have a good name. You know, that's the way I kind of look at it. And Eddie's won the world title with it. He's, you know, he doesn't overuse it because some he sometimes he uses the Emerald Fusion, and so he doesn't overuse the Boston Knee Party. So it's actually a finisher that I kind of dig. Um, but again, he looks ridiculous. Uh, when he when he was babyface Eddie, he had all the green, and then he switched with Honor No More, and he changed up his color scheme. Like I think he came out with maybe like a like a goldish jacket or something. I don't remember exactly when he went the whole Y Eddie Y thing, and he came out and cut the promo. And then he's gone right back to the babyface colors. He has the same babyface entrance when he comes down. Like 
I just think someone needs to pull him aside to be like, dude, what you're doing, what you think is is being a heel is, is not, you know. Um, so yeah, but he gets a win. We knew it was gonna happen because there's you know collision course with PCO. Don't gotta overthink it. Eddie should have won the match. And then uh we get Gia and Frankie backstage. We're not even gonna talk about all that. They play a lot of the Josh Alexander stuff at this point. Um the video packages and showing that, you know, they're, they're explaining to us that he's injured, um, that he's not going to compete. And I've, I've got some more thoughts. I know I did a whole rant yesterday because it was fresh in my head, but I've got some more thoughts on, on the, the main event, um, coming up. My, my first inclination though, was seeing this was to think impact plus mid card when I'm talking about Kushida versus Macklin. That's the first thing I thought I was like, this is something we're going to watch on impact plus in the middle of the card because Macklin, even though he's earned this opportunity, he hasn't really been booked like a main eventer necessarily. I'm always saying this. Mike's always saying this on uh, Brace for Impact. Like he should be kicking people's asses. Like he should be getting some, in a sense, squash wins versus the versus the Heaths and the Dangos of the world. You know, when he's not. So, um, with the next match we get is Kylan King versus Rosemary. Uh, you know, this kind of felt like a fresh match. So I, I always, I'm always, uh good with fresh matches because we don't see Rosemary wrestle a whole lot. Uh, and Kylan King's new to the company. I really enjoyed the match. I thought Kylan King showed what she could do because a couple times we've seen her on TV and one-on-one, like she was just there to lose. I mean, she lost this match too, but she was just there to lose. So she didn't show us a lot of what she could do. And I thought she did with this match. She did a missile drop kick at one point. It might've been off the top rope or second rope or something like that. And it was just, Hits are perfect. It was beautiful. And I'm a big fan of hers. I want to see her do really, really well in Impact. Um, I thought this was like unnecessary 50-50 booking to keep keep this thing going with this team. Because Kylan King loses. We have seen Kylan King wrestle four times on our televisions, and she has lost three of them. And this is one of the knockouts tag team champions. I think she does pretty decent on her own. Uh, but when Taylor Wilde comes out, it's the tarot cards, then it gets it gets really, really hokey. But um I just I don't know if I like this. I don't know if I like her um, you know, taking these losses. She she should be the 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 dominant one of the group, you know, and we we just see her lose on TV. So the knockouts tag team titles are in, are in big trouble, folks. Um, we're gonna see what what they do with it. But right now, the you know she loses, so the coven has no momentum. We we've, we've we've cut them off after winning the titles, taking immediate immediate loss. So I don't know. They, they're just trying to find a way to keep this thing going. But there's a lot of 50-50 booking and impact. We don't they, we don't see a lot of rematches. That's why. We hear Tom Hannafin nine times in episodes, like first time match ever, Saban versus whoever. And um, so we don't get a lot of rematches, but when we do, it's it's always very 50-50. It's not like, uh, you know, some, so-and-so is going to get the rematch and then they're going to win this time. Like the only time that that hasn't happened was Masha and um, Jordan Grace. Like they had a great match. Jordan wins. They have another match. Jordan wins again. So it killed Masha, but at least it kept Jordan rolling you know and we don't we don't see that a whole lot we just see a lot of like i get a win you get a win type of thing um all right so oh this the other the silly thing too is ray wall's like oh this opens them up for number one contendership for the knockouts tag team titles like no they're they're number one contenders because they don't the only other team number one number two are we we just picking are we picking and choosing this like rematch clause thing like Come on. Okay. Anyway, let's get into the opening match here. We got uh, Mike Bailey versus Jonathan Gresham. I knew Mike Bailey was going to win this match because I just said 50 50. That's how they do this, especially with Mike Bailey. If you've noticed, every time Mike Bailey has lost, they get him his win back almost immediately. It doesn't matter if it's Trey Miguel or whoever has beat him, he will get his win back after that. That's just. You know, he's someone they want to keep strong. So, it, but it, it's just, you just know it's coming. You just know he's going to get his win back. But this was, this was a good opening match. It was a little slower than I think we expected. Uh, there was a lot of chain wrestling, which is good. It was, it was still great. I think we just expected 
a lot more pace uh, or a lot quicker pace, I should say. And that's not, not necessarily what we got. There was a really weird count out spot where they were like going back and forth, pulling each other out of the ring when they, when, when the other one was trying to climb in and trying to get the other one counted out. Mike Bailey got counted out folks. I know that he wasn't counted out on the show, but he was out there for the 10 count. Um, that was that was a very silly spot, I thought. But other than that, um, I thought it was just like two two good wrestlers who just um, who really put on a, a wrestling clinic, you know. And I talk a lot about rest, you know, good matches for the sake of good matches and all that shit. That is kind of what this was, but it was good to see Jonathan Gresham. I don't think he's turning heel, but I think he he it just shows what a professional is because he what a professional he is because he really embraced the heel role in this match because Mike Bailey, much like Bupinder was, was a local dude there. So the fans were not going to be behind him. So he really embraced it. And I want to see more of him on TV. Like we just get this like little, little bit of Jonathan Gresham and I I don't really understand why, but I want to see a lot more of him. I, I really enjoy, um, when he's out there, but we, but we had a good match and, and, and Mike Bailey won. I've never seen in my time as rest, a wrestling fan, someone win via tap out with that reverse figure four, flipping the figure four over. I've never seen that. I don't even know that that hurts. When I was a kid and I used to wrestle with my friends, that was like my finisher, the figure four. But because I actually learned how to do it, uh, I know that it hurts, but I've never actually been like flipped over or flipped someone else over. I don't know that that, in my mind, I don't see how that's any different than a regular figure four, but you know, maybe it does hurt. It says it reverses the pressure, but that is a move that I have seen on TV since I was a child because the figure four in the eighties and nineties was a finisher. There were several, you know, Ric Flair, obviously, uh, Greg the Hammer Valentine, um, or someone else in my in my head that I'm thinking of, and I can't quite place them, but but it was a move that people use and they won matches with. And uh, I'd always seen that spot flipping them over, but no one's ever tapped out from it. So um, that was, that was interesting. That was cool. It was just, I'm always down if we can just see something that's not a finisher to finish a match, you know? Um, What do we got next? So GM Miller is backstage with Brian Myers and Moose. Um, And and Moose is saying, I'm going to help you win the title. Moose hardly wrestles. You know, this is what they really should have been doing with Josh Alexander instead of having him unnecessarily wrestle all the time. Um, at least my opinion is unnecessary, and now he's injured. But Moose is um, Moose is very protected in this sense. But he was, you know, his face was shown. And that Santino came and said, you know, whatever he said, don't you know I have two ears um, in my head? So they kick Moose out. And he has banned Moose. He's forbidden Moose, I think he said, from, from being there. So we know we're just getting a one-on-one match for the joke title a little bit later. Um, then we get Brian Myers versus Joe Hendry. And they did this, like, they do these graphics. They've been doing this lately. It said um, fight bites on this one. And they're trying to capture, um, I don't know, maybe from, like, MMA or something where they show graphic of the two people. And then they'll have a little bit of a narrative. They're right, you know, this person, this and this and this. Whoever writes this has to be 12 years old because they they read like we like we speak. So just pay attention to that next time. There was one today, the X Division one, that was looked fine. But other than that, every time they put something over, it's like, and then and this happened, and it's it's like a like a child talking. It's it's like so strange. Like instead of like bullet points, it's like these like weird half sentence weird i don't i don't even know how to explain it but uh they look really unprofessional to me but i i like the idea i think the idea is great i just think the execution is is um ass cheek but we got brian myers versus joe hendry joe hendry came out i didn't understand what the hell he was talking about he cut a promo that i i thought was not necessary um If there was an episode of Impact, okay, come out and talk. But I just I don't see on this episode or in this special why he needed to do that. And I didn't understand what the hell he was talking about. He was trying to crack some jokes. They they either didn't hit or they just flew over my over my head. It's possible that you guys heard these and oh, but I'm like I don't understand what he's talking about. Uh, And then Brian Myers comes out. 
they had a match that you would expect them to have. This didn't, you know, uh, people are not writing home. They're not emailing, you know, their mom and dad saying, yo, you got to check this match out. Um, this was tremendous. They're not emailing their friends. They're not posting it on social media, but it was still really solid. And Joe Hendry is very good at what he does. You know, he knows how to mix like being funny with kind of going out there and competing. And much like Brian Myers to an extent, too, because he's also someone who's pretty funny, but he does not go out there and do bad comedy and try to make people laugh. You know, he doesn't have people biting him in the ass cheek and him dancing around. He doesn't do silly shit like he goes out there and he competes. He just happens to be funny and it works for his character. So uh, I wouldn't mind seeing more from these guys, to be honest, as much as I don't like watching the same match over and over like these two kind of um, entertain me. But. Jonathan Gresham, or Jonathan Gresham, Joe Hendry wins with uh, the standing ovation. I don't think this is over. <laughs> um, I actually thought Brian Myers was going to win the title here, to be honest with you. But um, either way, I don't. Moose is still involved in this. He's still going to be feuding with Joe Hendry one way or another. This is not over. This is not over. So, so don't think like what's next for Joe Hendry. Uh, Brian Myers is next for Joe Hendry. Okay, Moose is next for Joe Hendry. It's it's, it's not going anywhere. Then we get um, Mickey, James, Gia, and Santino backstage. So they were kind of teasing, you know, hey, Mickey James is going to announce uh, the the status of the knockouts title because we know she's hurt. Part of me think it's a, it's a, thinks it's a work, but I don't think you would put Mickey James on a card and then pull her off. I don't. That's pretty counterproductive uh, but they i thought they handled this really really well because you can't just strip mickey james of the title now you can't not after josh alexander had to relinquish do you can you imagine the headlines and the lols that the social media would have had if they were just like hey impact's top two titles um top two champions were forced to relinquish their titles you know so I thought they handled this well. Mickey James is probably not going to wrestle. That's my gut. I, I don't know for sure. I have a feeling she's not going to wrestle and do the three way. But they, but the way they were like, she's like, I'm going to be there one way or another. And you know, if you didn't, if you didn't see this, they were they were saying Jordan Grace, since you were going to have a title shot tonight, you're going to wrestle the uh, the winner of the women's four way at the multiverse United. And if Mickey James is healthy, it's going to be a three way at rebellion. If not, it's going to be two on two. They better pray. Mickey James is healthy because um, she's the draw in the division. And you've already got a world title match. That's not going to be a, a draw necessarily. Doesn't mean I'm, I'm not looking forward to it. I am. I look forward to anything. Steve Macklin does. But you need Mickey James is still like one of your headliners. Like you really, really need her there. Um, so Santino had no clue who's in the match at Multiverse United. Not a clue in fucking hell. So he just said the match. But it's um uh Masha Sheets replacing Mickey James, uh Giselle Shaw, Deanna Perrazzo, and uh the female Yuya Yomura. I don't I don't remember what her name was. Um not for the life of me. I thought I kind of wrote it down. I don't, I don't remember. I'm not familiar with her, to be honest with you. Many of you m may be. I have no clue who she is. Um, she's not going to win. I know that. Who's going to win that, though? Probably Deanna Perrazzo, because that's the match you know. You know when Deanna and Grace wrestle that it's a match of the year candidate. Like, you know that. I think it should be Giselle Shaw, to be honest. Um, I think we're not too far out from her knockouts championship run. And the, the other inter interesting thing here is that, you know, they tease that when Mickey James loses, she's going to lose the, you know, she's going to retire. And I don't know for sure because they got away from that narrative. She said many times on screen, like, oh, the last rodeo, but she sounds like she makes it sound like the last rodeo was over. Like it happened. So I don't know if it was like, hey, I'm going to win the title. And if I don't, I'll retire. Or if it's next time I lose, I'm going to retire because they've got away from the narrative a little bit. But like when they're talking about the Mercedes Monet match and other things, there's there's oh, you know she could retire from it. I I just feel like they've gotten away from the narrative, and I don't really know what it is anymore. But if she was to vacate the title, 
this could like prolong her career and impact. So it's going to be interesting. My gut feeling is that she's not going to wrestle at a, that rebellion, but maybe she will. I don't know. I think they really, uh, really need her though. Thank God they're in Canada where they're going to have a really hot crowd and all that because, um, they're lacking the star power at the moment. After this, oh, me, me, oh, something. I, that's all I wrote down. Yuyamura. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Um, then we have the match, which is a uh, Giselle Shaw versus Deanna Perazzo. Savannah Evans has changed her look, and now it it really works. It really fits because I thought at first when they put her in there, it was just it was really really random. And every week that passes, she's starting to look a little bit more. You know, she's got the chains and stuff going around. Like, and now she's redone her hair and she's got glasses, so she fits the gimmick now. Finally, so these two have a match. The crowd loves Deanna. I don't know if I'm a big Deanna babyface fan. I know I think she was such a good heel, but um, you know they allowed to chant verse, allowed people to chant virtuosa, and I say aloud because um, a good heel when people start cheering for them and chanting for them, they will do something to shut them up and, and to boo them. You know, like MJF does that all the time. So um, I don't know this this change obviously was was coming and i don't really like it but you know I, I still like what diana does and i really enjoy the match this this was a good this really was a good show guys the last show i just ugh, whatever it was no surrender whatever i was just not feeling it with the exception of of josh and, and rich swan in the main event uh but this one was was really good top to bottom i thought and this was a knockouts match that i quite enjoyed i didn't expect Giselle Shaw to win because she kind of won last time cheating. And I really think Giselle Shaw needs some momentum because it just feels like every time she's out there, she loses. She, well, she beat Deanna, right? She, she, she cheated and beat Deanna. Um, but then who did she wrestle? Jordan Grace or what? I don't remember whatever main, Oh no, it was Mickey James. I'm sorry. And, and there was that ridiculous finish where, uh, Deanna costed the match and all that. Like Giselle has no momentum. And when she challenged Mickey James and said, you faced a Giselle, Giselle Shaw, not this Giselle, Giselle Shaw. Like it just seemed like that was the beginning of something, but it, but it wasn't. Um, so unfortunately, but um, she loses, Giselle Shaw loses and they start jumping her after the match. Oh, Giselle Shaw used a, a move here. A brand new move. I don't know if they call it the shock and lock, the shock and awe. I so he said this like three times, and I'm like, I have no clue what you're saying. So leave it in the comments if you have a clue what he said. It, I don't even know. Maybe it wasn't even English because some of these wrestlers now like to use these finisher names that are just I don't know what any of the words mean. So maybe I maybe I, I think shock was the first part. I don't know, but anyway. It was like a full Nelson backbreaker into a face plant. And, you know, every week I'm talking about Impact's finishers. Where's the cool finishers? And this is one of them. Like combination finishers are cool. Like I used to like Eli Drake used to do the blunt force trauma. I know he didn't like that move that much. That's why he moved to the gravy train. Um, and the gravy train had a cooler name, so it worked. But, well, I guess that's up for debate. But the blunt force trauma I thought was a much better finisher. Uh, but I like I like combination finishers, and no one really has those in impact, you know. So um I don't I'm not a big fan of her whatever the fuck that running knee thing she does, that running kick. We've seen that, you know, it, it's similar to Boston Knee Party, it's similar to Ro Rohit's drive by, it's similar to the spotlight kick from uh uh to Neil Dashwood, like we just seen it so much. Someone else won with it the other day. Uh, it might have been Jonathan Gresham. I say the other day, it was like a month ago. It was just like a running kick. I'm just like, what is the obsession with this move? So I I hope that she switches to this and starts winning matches with this move because it's 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 much better. I know um, she didn't get the the pinfall here, but I I hope that she does. So there's a post match angle. They're attacking her. Tasha Steeles comes down. And Tasha Steele's pulled a Matt Hardy, you know, like when Matt Hardy came to, or pulled a Jeff Hardy when he came to save Jeff, save 
excuse me, let me start again. Pulled a Jeff Hardy when he came to save Matt Hardy last year and had a dance on his way to, to the ring, you know. Uh, <laughs> she came down and, and did her thing, made sure, made sure she got it in first. Before I talk about the in-ring stuff there, I thought she really came off like a star. Like she, Tasha Steeles felt like a big deal when she came out. She has improved so much uh, from the from when we first saw her up to now, like improving her look and the way she carries herself, you know, like she really came off um, like a big deal. And how can we miss you if you don't go away? Like she went away for a little bit and it was a, it was a nice little return. She goes to the ring and there, there's some intrigue there. Like she gets in Savannah Evans face and she's, you know, telling her to do the full Nelson slam and look like she's on her side, but also kind of questioning what is she doing with Giselle? And then she hits her like so. At first, this was not good. I, I liked where it was going, and then she did this like really weak punch on the back, and then there was uh, you know, Jay Vidal came in, and it was just all moving really, really slow. And I'm just like, are we? What are we gonna get here? And then Tasha hit that tornado DDT, and the uh, the roof came off the place like that. That was great. Jay Vidal can work. It's like Johnny Swinger. I didn't know this kid could work. Uh, he takes these moves and he makes them look like a million bucks. But he took that DDT. It looked amazing. And then uh, he gets hit with the cutter, which is my least fa- one of my least favorite moves in the wrestling in the in the wrestling world because it doesn't hurt. Their face doesn't hit the mat. Um, it's the pillow finish. You know, their, their head just lands on a pillow, and um, and that's it. Like I hate that move. I wish she would have like shown us something brand new, what you know, when she went away, but it's whatever. So we're getting, I guess, baby face Tasha Steels. A year ago, if you were to tell me that Deanna Perazzo and Tasha Steels were gonna be baby faces um in March of 2023, I would have said, Go fuck yourself. Like I no in no way would I've thought that would have happened or that I would I've said that it should happen. But it's something different. So we're going to see. I'm sure there's going to be a feud, obviously, between Giselle and Tasha Steeles. Giselle will probably lose again. I don't know. But it's something new. It's something fresh. Um, so I, I, I'm pretty sure on this next episode of Impact, if I know Impact, then I do, we're probably going to get Tasha and Deanna versus Giselle and uh, Savannah Evans. And Giselle and, Chad, uh, and Savannah Evans will not win. I know that. But I, but I feel like that's where they're going with it. But the fans really reacted to Tasha Steeles out there. And there was no reason for them to turn her baby face or for the fans to even get behind her. Because the fans boo her for the most part. She's been a heel. Like, she doesn't work like a baby face. But I think sometimes when you make that return, you just get that baby face reaction or whatever. And, um, you know, if she was a heel, she would have come down without her music. She would have just ran out there. But usually when the music hits, or, uh, it's kind of a sign that it's a baby face thing. So we're gonna see how um how she is. We're, we're we're gonna see. So after that, Kenny King with the Honor No More shirt. I don't know if they have this like surplus back, you know, in, in the back there. <laughs> I don't know. There's, I mean, you can still make them Honor No More. You know, I don't think they're going to, but him and Eddie. But it was funny that he came out with the shirt. You know, Han- Hannafin with King King wearing the Honor No More shirt. Never thought I'd see that again. Kenny King has a good theme song. There's not a lot of good theme songs on Impact. I'm always saying that. He he has a pretty good theme. Him doing the Frankenstein is is hilarious. He's got his match with PCO. Uh, I'm starting to come around on PCO. I was not a really big fan over the past year of him. But I think because of his inclusion with Honor No More, him wrestling like a baby face. He didn't really fit Honor No More. Uh, wrestling like a baby face and a heel faction and, and wrestling against heels while he was a heel. Like there, there was just a lot that I wasn't feeling, but now I'm starting to like understand the gimmick a little bit better. I'm starting to get into, I'm starting to be a little more impressed with what he can do. Um, It's very reminiscent of like the early undertaker where you couldn't really hurt him. Like you could, you can like stun him for a bit. You could take him off his feet for a little while, but he's going to get back up shortly after. Uh, and that's kind of what they do with him, but it, but it works. I'm st- so I'm starting to come around on it. I actually enjoyed this match quite a bit as well. 
I have a feeling I'm go- I enjoy this match a lot more than I will the the eventual PCO and Eddie Edwards match. Uh, but I I thought this was was really good. I didn't expect Kenny King to win at all. I I, I knew PCO was going to win this thing, and there was a little bit of fuckery with the the steel chair and and all that stuff. And uh, PCO ultimately wins by punching the steel chair and hitting hitting Kenny King. And this is another match that. You know, there wasn't a finisher used. And there's a couple matches like this on the show. And I'm I'm always for that. You know, like I just want to see matches end uh, differently sometimes than what we're used to. Because that's going to keep us on our toes more as fans when we don't know when the pinfall is coming. When it's like the clear, um, you know, got to hit the finisher. If this was AEW, he would have hit, uh, punched him through the chair. And then climbed up to the top rope and hit his finisher unnecessarily when the first match, first move could have won the match. And when you do that, you devalue the move that you just did. Um, another example is when Josh Alexander jumped off the ladder onto Bully Ray onto the chair uh, through the table. I had said at, at the time, at Hard to Kill, like that should have been the finish to the match because that was the most climactic part of the match. So just like PCO hitting the chair, knocking Kenny out, like that was the impact move. That's what everyone's like, oh. So that's when you take advantage and you get the pin. And then, but with Josh, he did that and then felt the need to put on the ankle lock, which to me is a very anticlimactic move. Because I was such a big Kurt Angle fan, I'm not going to say, oh, I don't like the ankle lock, but I always thought it was like a very unrealistic way to win a match because the tap out never looks good. They're always flailing their, their arms like those, you know, those, Bailey blow up dolls that she used to have, like that they have on the corner of the of the uh, the uh, the, the car lot, you know. Um, that's always how it looks. Uh, so you know, I like the way that they ended this match. It, it was good stuff. So, um, yeah, I just I just really enjoy this show, folks. Um, then we get coming soon, Jody Threat. I know her by name. I don't know anything about her. I'm sure Lewis is going to let me know like she's a star and she's going to do this and this, but uh, I'm not familiar with her, but we are always going to welcome new knockouts. You know, that that's been the, the trend lately is this like really rough type of chick. I don't mean rough looking. I just mean like kind of like the badass, you know, the Masha, the killer Kelly, like that's kind of where they're, they're going with it. I do think we need to get, uh, let me, let me not get into that. Um, I'm going to sound sexist, but that that's the vibe that that's what they're going for right now. That's the incoming knockout. So I don't know much about Jody threat. I'm, I'm going to look her up, but I, I am familiar with her by name. After this, we get Frankie Kazarian backstage with Rich Swan and Macklin and the lighting looked great. Good lighting, good natural lighting, no pink lights. Uh, you know, I, I, I always talk about these lights cause I hate the lights. I noticed AEW does the same thing, but they are in video packages. So Impact used to do the little Macklin video packages where he had the green light in the background. Deanna did one recently with blue. That's fine. But when you just have the random big lots lighting set up throughout the arena in random places, and then you go hang out by the light, like it looks so stupid. You know, this was just... Three dudes talking in the locker room. The lighting was great. Like it looked like a wrestling show. It didn't look phony at all. Um, you know, they had a couple segments with these guys because they're they're trying to tell this story. They had to do some degree of storytelling up to the main event because obviously Steve Macklin was inserted in there to replace Josh Alexander. Really weird dynamic. So they, you know, they had to do a degree of storytelling, which is fine. I appreciated Macklin telling them because I, I just I know this thinking as a as a military guy myself. Like you may not like who you work with, but you're gonna get the job done. You're gonna get the mission done. Like at the end of the day, you're gonna get each other's backs, whether you like each other or not. And then when you're done with that, you're done with the mission, like don't talk to them, you know? So Macklin is what a military veteran should be on TV. That's how they should be portrayed, not wearing camouflage and doing salutes and attention because that's not how any of us fucking act or dress. Um, it's more about a mindset. 
you start doing all the other stuff, you make stuff, you make it Hollywood, you know? So that's why old girl in WWE doesn't get over and doesn't connect with the audience because it's not genuine the way Steve Macklin does it. Very, very genuine because he portrays a mindset, core values, all that stuff within his character. Um, and it works and it connects and it's good. Then we get Trey Miguel versus Lince Dorado. I'm not super familiar with him and, and he's Puerto Rican. So I, I guess I should know who he is, but uh, I, I'm just not. I think he was in WWE, right? Was he part of that like Lucha House Party thing? I'm, I might be pulling that out of my ass. I don't, I don't really know. He came out and, uh, he, you know, he's got some like swag about him. If people even use that word anymore, he's got a bit of a character. He gets um, an attitude acro projected across. And usually guys with masks struggle to do that. And usually guys who have a mask and their mouth is showing is usually like a goofy mask character. You know, so uh, I, I thought he was cool. He came, he came off cool. He didn't do any, like it was a Lucha match, but he didn't do anything ridiculous, you know. It was a very good X Division title match. This was the hand-picked opponent of, of Santino. And uh Trey Miguel, I know it's his themes, like his new theme song. I know it's him rapping on it and he made a, a custom song. I don't really like it. I liked his old theme song a lot better. I'm not saying this one's bad. It's not. I just thought the other one was really, really good. And uh, there's there's a lot of guys in the company who change their theme just for the sake of, of of doing it. And it's usually for the worst, in my opinion. Like Sammy Callahan and OVE, like they they were uh Sammy had changed his and then OVE changed theirs. And it was like the, for the worse, in my opinion. And I thought Trey's other one was, was a lot better, but it's all good. It's whatever. Trey Miguel is one of the best parts of the show. Uh, you notice they didn't have uh, the design on this at all because the design is one of the worst parts of impact every week. Now I was optimistic. Now I'm like, they're one of the worst parts and they weren't, they didn't, we didn't have them on the show and the show like benefited from it. But Trey's one of the best parts of the show. He he has made a transition from babyface to heel that has really, really worked. Like, I think Eddie Edwards needs to pay attention to that a little bit. But it's really worked. He still stayed true to his wrestling style, but he's 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 made it heel, too. Like, he's not out there, Sammy Guevara, like, doing flips just for the pops, just to get babyface pops, you know? He's uh, he's really good. He's He's, I hope that after this, title run whenever he loses it i think he's gonna have it for a while i hope that they're able to elevate him up to the card i think he had he should have been part of the main event scene by this point but it's fine because he had a he had a gimmick switch he's a heel now so you can you can re put the reset on, on him a little bit but i really think the next level is coming soon for him but we had a good match here we had we had a great just a good x division title match i enjoyed watching it quite a bit even though uh i'm not you know, the biggest fan of, uh, not the biggest fan. I'm not the biggest, uh, I don't have the most knowledge on Dorado. Like I, I've heard of him a couple times and that is, that is the extent. I didn't write it in my uh, notes. I forgot how Trey won the match. I feel like it was some kind of roll up something or other. I, I don't remember, but maybe we'll see Dorado more in impact. I, I hope so. I think he would be uh, beneficial to the X division. But I don't know. He might have just he might have just come in to come in. I don't know. Usually they don't one off people. We use that term a lot, but Impact doesn't usually pay people one time. Usually they're they're paid to come in for two or three matches. So I mean, if you're gonna fly them out there to do the show, like you're gonna use them, you know. So I would imagine this next set of tapings, we're gonna get a little bit of him, and then we'll see going forward if they're gonna use him or not. TMDK took on the Bullet Club. I thought the promo beforehand calling them like the the micro minis and the junior bullet club. I, th I thought that was pretty good. I initially didn't have a lot of interest in this, but as I was watching it, I got into it. I wasn't really familiar with TMDK. Like I know some of the guys in the group now uh, after Shane Haste showed up on impact and I'm like, who the hell is this? And then I saw it was slap ass from Re 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 retribution or whatever the hell they were called. And now he's doing the Japan stuff. And, and then I, saw uh zach saber jr was was a part of them so now i'm starting to understand them a little bit and i thought they were a pretty good team it showed to me like the lack of good tag teams we have in impact because it always i don't say always but ever since like the good brothers showed up it was it was this one team division two team division and they just really failed to like you know they had other like reno scum they had triple xl they had uh 
you know, the OVE guys at one point. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Like they've had tag teams, but they just don't present them in a way where you think they're credible threats for the championship. And it was nice here to get this team because – it just seems like every title match is the bullet club versus the motor city machine guns. I know they don't wrestle that much, but it feels like I've seen that 50 times over the last half year. So it was, it was, uh, you know, something kind of fresh. And these are the kind of teams I, I wish they would bring in. I know they're probably, they probably can't with these guys, but it shows that like you can put good tag teams together, like the good hands, they're a tag team but you just know they're going to lose when they go out there. So why not take a chance uh, on bringing on some indie tag teams and, and get them hot, get them some wins or, or put together guys that, you know, put Jack Price and Jackson Stone together. They're not doing Jack shit. See if they can get over as a, as a, as a real tag team and you can do something with them. I think impact benefits from a deep tag team division. And we haven't had that in so long. Like it's, it's again, just the one, two team division. So it's nice to see a really good, outside team come in and you know it's, it's the same when aussie open shows up and everything and these are teams that most impact fans aren't super familiar with but they get over with us so it just shows like you know take a chance on on, on bringing in some tag teams even if we're not familiar with them and, and maybe you can make something out of them but this was another good match bullet club won. we knew they were gonna win i mean come on then we get the busted open match. This was the one I was like, I don't want to watch this. Uh, but it wasn't that bad. Bully Ray versus Tommy Dreamer. I still stand by the fact that they should not be wrestling each other. I think the angles have actually been okay. The story's been okay. I just don't think they should be wrestling each other. Or even if you're, I mean, I guess it's okay for them to wrestle each other, but I, I feel like they could have waited on it. I mean, it, it, it's like when Bully Ray showed up, it just felt like this. It was an inevitability that he was going to fight Tommy Dreamer. I think I would have appreciated more if like bully was do, doing stuff and working with other people. And then, then these two run into each other and history and blah, 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 you know what I mean? But um, this, this was better than I thought it was going to be. I think just calling it a busted open match and making it a first blood rather than doing the old school rules thing, even though it's kind of a similar match. I think that made it work for me. And the ref bump was ridiculous. I mean, he was out for like 45 minutes. But I liked the story to where Bully Ray got busted open. He's trying to get the blood off. Um, I think they were trying to bust Tommy Dreamer open a lot sooner than he actually did. Like when they put his raked his face in the pins, the thumbtacks. I think that's where they were trying to get it going and it just wasn't happening. So they had to have the referee laying on his stomach for for 53 minutes uh nothing is nothing is worse than what hebner got uh brian hebner got the the beer in his eyes it was it was a uh, james storm and it might have been no it wasn't james storm versus bobby root there were there was a match with one of those two guys and he got beer in his eyes and he was blinded for like 30 minutes 32 minutes you know it was the most painful thing i've ever seen in my life so this wasn't that bad because it wasn't like he was blinded, you know, pretending to be blinded, but he was knocked out for quite a while. This was going on like entirely too long, but I thought the the idea of busting Tommy open and then the ref seeing it, I thought that was actually kind of creative. I, I don't think that the feud's going to go on any further. I don't think Tommy Dreamer is going to find a way to get his win back. I think that uh, Bully needed this win. Because he lost his last feud and they can't just have him come in and keep losing. You know, but they did it in a way where Tommy Dreamer, because they gotta keep gotta book Tommy Dreamer strong, gotta keep him strong. He didn't look weak. Um it, I, I thought it was pretty creative. And then after the match, he's getting into it with the dude from the D Detroit Red Wings. I don't watch hockey. I watch a lot of sports, and the hockey is not one of them. I couldn't tell you uh, I know like three players. And that's on a good day. I've been to same St. Louis Blues games out here, and I've really enjoyed myself. But to say that I'm like a hockey fan, I, I don't know. I don't know who anyone is. I just know growing up in Southern California, I knew Wayne Gretzky because uh, he was there on the Kings. But, you know, other than that, I don't know. If I had to root for a team, I'd probably root for the Ducks. And then because uh, that's the hometown team from where I'm from. 
I mean, I'm really from that area. And then uh, I guess I guess I support the blues because they're local to where I live, but I don't know jack shit. Uh, it's very rare that we see public figures in Impact, so it was kind of cool. At first, I was like, oh, that's awesome. They're they're there to watch wrestling, you know, cool. But then as the, this match progresses, it's like, oh, they were brought in for the angle. Or maybe they were there and they decided to use them. I think they were probably brought in, brought in for the angle. But uh, it worked, too, the way Bully Ray was, you know, uh, face-planted him and all that stuff or face-palmed him. It worked. Bully Ray is a heat magnet. He knows how to get heat. He does a really, really good job with it. Um, but after the match, you know, security's holding the guy back and he's yelling, fuck you. And <laughs> he did a pretty good job from an acting standpoint. Um, and then they bring him in, you know, Bully Ray says security let him in. He runs in and they're exchanging punches. They looked a little fake at first, but then then they started doing better, started picking up. I'm sure Bully Ray was like, I can take it. Uh, and then this, it was just lasting forever. That was the problem. As long as that referee was laying out, like that's how much time was going on post match too. Like it was, it was just, it was never ending. Um, and then they put the dude through a table. He's out cold. I never agree with that out cold thing. Like if I went through a table right now, like I'd be in pain and I'd probably be laying down for a while. And I think that's more realistic than like, like if you put me through a table, I wouldn't be like, oh, I'm done. I'm out. But it's whatever. It's pro wrestling, right? Before they put him through the table, I was like, they're gonna make this motherfucker fight Bully Ray at a and uh, like a rebellion or something. Like that's where totally where I thought it was going. Uh, but now I, I don't think so. So they put him through the table. Yuya Yomura randomly comes out. I'm like, I so as a fan, I have not connected with this guy. I feel like he just showed up randomly. I treated him like a part-timer in my head. And I think he's actually signed. But they're trying to push him off as like the young Japanese upstart and shit like that. But it, it for me, it does not click. And they always have to tell you, oh, he was taken out by Bully Ray on the third Tuesday of this and this. And they tie it in. And like he he doesn't register as a wrestler in the company to me. Like I'm not connected to anything he does. So when every time he comes out, my first you know, like when they put him randomly in that main event a couple months ago, my first thinking is like, what is he doing here? I don't, I don't know what the the the, the tie in is, but thank God, Tom. You know, oh, you yeah, he he you know against Ray several months ago was taken out. So, okay, cool. Um, he gets his ass kicked. Looks like a jobber. Treat him like a fucking jobber. I don't I don't think he's ever won a match. I, I I can't think of one. I'm sure he has like that X Division tournament that was on uh before the impact or whatever the hell the qualifying match. I, I'm sure he's won something here and there. I've never seen him win, couldn't tell you his finisher. I barely uh remember his name without seeing it written down first. I do like that he has the red trunks that looks like the the freaking eighties where they just wore like a, a singular color, you know. <laughs> um and then Scott Dumore comes out. Nobody asked for this. I'm not going to shit on this too much, but I'm just, at first I said, nobody asked for this. I thought they wrote him off TV because he was promoted within the company. Um, and we weren't going to see him on screen anymore, which was good for me. I've, I've always said I find him to be an, a very annoying on-screen character. I appreciate what he does for Impact, don't get me wrong. But as an on-screen character, I've always found him a little bit annoying. I think a lot of people agree with that. He comes out, takes the headset off. So this is clearly a gimmick. This is Scott does a lot on on TV to pop himself or to pop the people backstage. I, I've just I've really picked up on that. The headset thing is not an accident. Like that is something they think is funny backstage. It's not. Spoiler alert. But he takes the headset off. He comes out, and then. Where I thought this was going when he started doing the come here, you know, I thought the good the good hands were going to turn on Bully Ray, which would have been a huge mistake. But I thought that's what they were going to do. But he's like, come on, come on. And I'm thinking, and I'm sure you were too watching this, that they're going to debut someone or there's going to be some kind of big return. Like he he's like someone, someone's fucking coming out. Petey Williams is coming out or some shit. I know he's not, it's not him. He's with WWE, but... We're th like it, it just came off like 
something big's gonna happen, and fucking Heath comes out, and then it's Joe Hendry and it's Rhino and it's Gresham. It, it, it's this random hodgepodge of guys, and even though they're not jobbers, they looked like jobbers the way they came out because it was so random. You got one guy who's one of your champions. You know, usually you don't put champions in this kind of angle. Jonathan Gresham should not have been in this. Like, if you wanted to bring Heath and Rhino out there and Uemura and I don't even know if I say his name right, to be honest with you. I need to look that up. If you want to bring some of these guys who don't win matches on your show, then then bring them out there. Bring Dirty Dango out. You know what I'm saying? But I thought I thought he made – I thought all the auxiliary – parts here pieces look like jobbers from from yuya to to all the way to heath and everything in between i thought they came off like jobbers but it's whatever they had to do it to get the numbers game the numbers advantage um i got a bad feeling that this is leading to to like a vince mcmahon versus bret hart match where it was like no disqualification and you just had one of the worst matches in, in the history of wrestling by the way that they did at wrestlemania and you know, it was the Hart family versus Vince and all this shit. Like, I, I've got this, like, bad feeling. But I don't think anyone was asking for Scotty Moore to return to television. But he did. That fucking Canadian destroyer he hit, though. Everything negative I say about Scott. That was freaking impressive. I could not believe he did that. This little fat motherfucker. He didn't even tease it for that long. Like, he put the head between the legs and he hit the move. Like, he boom. Like, there was no... Um, you know, and it was clean. You know what? It was, dude. I mean, the crowd went crazy for this. Are we supposed to believe that Scott Demore is going to fight Bully Ray, though? This is going to be the storyline that dominates the next several months is Bully Ray versus Scott Demore. I don't know how Mickey James factors into all this now because he's always fucking with Mickey James. And I, d- I don't know how she factors in, especially with her being hurt. But this storyline is going to dominate the show. It is going to dominate it to the point that we forget what the main event is at Rebellion. I promise you. It's going to probably be the more, most viewed thing on YouTube. I'm, I'm going to be doing a podcast here talking about uh, some of the YouTube content they're doing and what the what the views are and what they should and shouldn't focus on based on these views. Um, but there's going to be a lot of YouTube content. It's it's going to dominate like the middle of the show, like the nine o'clock hour. It's because Impact comes on at eight, right? I don't ever watch it. I think it comes on at eight Central, nine Eastern. But that that second hour, that is going to be like the Bully Ray. Uh, Scott you more thing if they're not kicking off the show they're going to kick off that second hour and it's going to it's going to dominate the program I'm just I am warning you people now fortunately everything bully Ray has been really good so far everything he's done has been good so far so hopefully it's not that bad but I'm just telling you right now it is going to dominate the show and then we get the main event oh they let us know slam anniversary is going to be there at Windsor so that's really awesome because um you know we're, we're going to probably get a good crowd good hot crowd in toronto uh, i don't know if they've ever recorded in toronto before or done tv or pay-per-views but i know the toronto raptors have really hot crowds so um that's going to be good and then we know that windsor just brings an incredible audience so we can expect the next couple of pay-per-views to look good and to sound good and and that is what sells people on um tuning in again when they've been doing these pay-per-views for all these years looking at the damn entrance ramp like no no one is who's checking out impact that day. Oh, let me, let me check it again the next day because it looks like shit like this. Now that we're going to see people having fun and engaged. Like I think it's going to be, um, uh, it's a word I'm looking for contagious. I think, I think it's going to set the the tone for how impact fans should act at shows. Um, and I think it's gonna be contagious. And the fact that some people are just going to start tuning in again, you know, this stuff really matters in my opinion. The main event is Time Machine versus Rich Swan, Frankie Kazarian, and Steve Macklin. So as I said, they did a couple backstage things leading up to this because they had to kind of tell a story here because, you know, Kashida's not going to be cutting in-ring promos and shit like this 
as much as I said Macklin was going to lead, was going to carry this feud with with Josh, he's really going to carry this shit now because because he because she is not going to come out there with a mic and start. I'm going to be Impact World Champ. Like, get the fuck out of here. Like, that is not going to happen. Matt, they're really, really going to rely on Steve Macklin for all this. Um, he's he's going to be a star in this company. He just is. The more I've thought about this main event, though, he's, even though I'm saying, you know, this is a, an Impact Plus mid-card match, uh, and I say that because Macklin is not typically presented as, he's presented as an up-and-comer, but not as a main event talent yet. He will be once he wins his title. And Kushida just shows up and has good matches, you know? So it made sense. You can't just take Kushida out of the title picture because he had the next title shot. But I thought they got backed into a corner because the match was unnecessary to begin with to even be booked. Um, if you wanted to have the match, just do a non-title match. And, hey, we're having an awesome match for you guys. You know, this guy hasn't earned a title shot, so we're not going to give him a title shot. And then with that, they could have said, okay, for the main event, we're going to have to do this and this. And the, the good thing is that they, they're getting ready to do television so they can course correct a little bit. They're not having to like redo television. They're not trying to have to, you know, all this television happen and they're going to have to go back and find a way to make it pretend it didn't happen. Like they can course correct on this set of tapings here. But had you not put yourself in this position where Kushida was wrestling for the title just so you could have a good match, you wouldn't be forced to put him in the main event of, of your one of your big pay-per-views. And you could have done some qualifier stuff and and you know, get some of these other dudes in there, get some other guys hot and then insert them into this. But um, that being said, the more I've thought about this, it's a very fresh match. Um, I don't know if it's going to close the show. It probably will now because Mickey's Mickey's not going to wrestle Jordan. So. Yeah, because they were wrestling. No, Mickey was wrestling Jordan at this show, right? They didn't announce her rebellion opponent yet. But Mickey was Mickey can't close the show. So this one this one may have to. So this is for both of these guys, but especially Steve Macklin. It's going to give him an opportunity to do something that they haven't done in Impact yet and to take the next step. Impact's going to be forced for some of these guys who haven't been main eventers or who haven't you know, wrestled in huge matches. They're going to be forced to step up. And, you know, the, the Steve Macklin may be asked to carry this company for a few months, you know, on his back. I think he can do it. Um so I'm not as out on this main event because we want to give we want to give people the opportunity to be in big matches and see what they do with that opportunity. You know, just uh, maybe two, three weeks ago, I was bringing up. I was watching an episode of Raw years ago, John Cena and the primetime players versus whoever. Um, I was just telling this story and Vince did not believe in the primetime players in a main event spot. So they never tagged into the match. Like they wrestled, they did moves, and they came in and did this, but they actually never tagged in. Cena wrestled the whole match, but they they formatted it so it wasn't that obvious. Instead of just saying, you know what, let's put these fools in a main event and let's just see what the hell happens. Like you ha sometimes you have to give opportunity. These two guys are gonna have an opportunity, so we'll see what happens. This was a, another really good match. Great way to, to end it. I wasn't expecting Macklin to lose. I was expecting Time Machine to win. I thought Kushida was going to get pinned at one point by Rich Swan's 450. <laughs> it's like no way this dude's losing. But I expected this to be the finish because they had to, to build it like Kushida has a chance to beat Macklin. I think that this finish was the one meant for Josh Alexander in, in the initial match. I think Josh was going to tap to this move because that was the story they were telling up to this was that he's vulnerable to this move. So I think that's what they were going to do. I think Josh was going to tap and then that was going to lead supposed to, you know, give interest up to their match next week, but they have Steve Mac Macklin tap to it. Steve Macklin is not going to lose this match of rebellion folks. Like I will, I will bet my savings account. I will bet my stocks. I will bet everything I have in the bank. Uh, he is not going to lose. A rebellion because she does not going to be the impact world champion. But this story I think was really beneficial for this where Macklin did lose. He did tap. So that gives us a, a that little bit. Well, maybe this fool can beat him. He is not going to, 
but at least in the back of our head, we're like, there's a chance that he can tap Macklin out, you know, since we've seen it. I think there's a good chance on television for Macklin to have a match with Frankie here soon and maybe even wrestle Rich Swan again. It's going to be interesting to see how they build this main event because, again, Kashida is not going to get out there with a the mic to open the show and tell you about his goals to win the Impact World title. You know, that's just not going to happen. But this was a great three on three match. It was just, it was a good way to end the show. And this is, I would have liked to see more of this when Josh before he was hurt where he was just wrestling six man matches and wasn't defending the title every, every two weeks, you know, like I, I just would have preferred more of this. I think that could have kept him wrestling, but also like pr- protected him to an extent too, um, instead of wrestling for 95 minutes and one week and then 92 minutes the next week and, and all that. I was looking forward to Macklin and Josh though, because I wanted to see what Macklin could do in a match with Josh, you know, and this was their most long-term thing that they were building. They were building up to this for a long time. And now we get this, but I'm, I am now more optimistic because we have to give them an opportunity to like prove us wrong. We're probably going to say they tore the house down after the match is over. I, I, I bet you that we will. Um, but I really like the whole Macklin money scout his opponent and all that shit. Like they're, they're doing some different stuff here. But uh, Macklin's going to be your new world champion. Don't don't think anything else. Uh, that is... Uh, no. This is how it's going to be. Scott does not course correct on stuff like this. So Josh was going to beat Kushida. We know he was going to. So uh, And Macklin was probably going to beat Josh. So he's just going to beat Kushida just the way it is. Um, but he has a chance to be their EC3, like I said. Um. I think he's going to be a real big star in this company one day. I get to meet Steve Macklin here in a couple of weeks. I'll tell you guys more about that later. I'll tell you about my experience as well. So that is it for um, talking sacrifice. Hope you guys enjoyed what I had to say and my thoughts of it. I'm sure you enjoyed sacrifice because it was a excellent show and I'm your boy BQ. If you want to hear this on streaming platforms, you can check out the Patreon. I'm out. Peace.